Hello everyone and thank you for joining us today for our HashiCorp Executive Summit on Financial Services. Uh, we appreciate taking the time to join us. My name is uh, Ilge Markovsky, I'm the Regional Director for HashiCorp Australia and New Zealand and I'll be MC today. Before we get started, I'd like to go a few housekeeping uh, and agenda items. First of all, I'd like to note that today's session is being recorded and the recording will be made available on our website soon. We will send an email to everyone on this call within the next day or so with a link to the recording. Today's webinar will run for about an hour and 15 minutes. We've allocated about 15 minutes at the end of the session for open Q&A. Please feel free to also submit questions throughout the webinar via the chat uh, as well, and we'll answer them as we go. Please also ensure you're muted and your video is off during the main presentation. So we've got a great program lined up for you today with HashiCorp CEO, Dave McJanet, kicking things off with a talk about HashiCorp's role in digital transformation. Our field CTO, Michael Wood, will then share the opportunities of technology adoption in financial services and how HashiCorp tools are driving innovation in the sector. And finally, Andrew Bryden, Senior Manager at National Australia Bank, will provide an inside look at how NAB are embracing innovation to deliver compliant infrastructure delivery that supports their rapid cloud adoption. As I mentioned, we will also have 15 minutes at the end for open Q&A, so make sure you stay on for that. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. Over to you, Dave. Great, thanks, Ailsh. So I'll just share my screen if, if, uh, if I can. I will um, yeah, take a moment here, maybe just to give a bit of background, and it's great to be with folks again. Sorry that I can't be there in person. I think I've a fair amount of time in the region over the last few years, um, but obviously this is this is a different world. I think it's been I see some familiar faces actually on the on the Zoom attendee list, which is kind of fun for us because now four and five years on, um, it's kind of interesting just to be able to share how we've grown over that course of time and how uh, kind of the what what for some of you was a company that you engaged with when we were really quite small. Today is a company that is north of a thousand people and. Um, pretty well established as an enabler of this cloud transition for many in the in the global 2000. For those that aren't familiar, our, our product portfolio is relatively broad. <clears throat> there are actually six products that we that we have. They're all made available in open source. And so I can, I've yet to come across a company that I visited that does not use one of these products somewhere in your, uh, in your application delivery process. Um, whether it's surfaced all the way up to, the, to your level or not, um, almost certainly these products are in use. We make these products available in open source for everybody. Uh, we, we've actually stopped counting because it's quite difficult to count uh, the actual downloads given that they're replicated uh, across the internet. So the last time I looked on Docker Hub, console alone had been downloaded more than 500 million times. So we sort of, we stopped counting at a certain point and just sort of acknowledge, yes, these products are ubiquitous. They're, they're used in your stack. Uh, and then over the last four or five years, we've really been focusing on helping people with the organizational challenges of running those products uh, through our commercial offerings. And today, as you can see, uh, we count eight of the Fortune 10 uh, and eight of the largest uh, financial service organizations in the world also are, are commercial customers of ours. And uh, we're up to uh, a little over 250 of the Global 2000, which gives a sense for sort of the growing role that we play, whether it's in the settlement of stock exchanges or for the uh, deliver, delivery of, you know, teleconferencing uh, apps like the ones we're using today. Uh, it's, it's suffice it to say that our products largely underpin many of those, those applications we use all day. And, and that, that's, that is why we exist. Uh, that's fun for us. That's, uh, you know, that's the role that we aspire to play. I just want to maybe tee it up um, how we think about the world more broadly and then maybe provide some commentary on the macro market on uh, as this cloud transition is becoming now, you know, eight or 10 years in. Uh, just sort of just maybe surfacing some of the patterns. I think the, this picture here, many of you have seen from us before, it's very familiar. Uh, we are going through an infrastructure transition that started in about 2008, 2009, when Amazon appeared on the, on, the, on, the, uh, on the scene. And all of a sudden, people that were trying to build net new digital applications were by and large building them on Amazon. Uh, if you needed to build a better app to interface to your customers, your partners, your employees, that new application was being delivered on Amazon. And that didn't escape the notice of Azure and Google and Alibaba and everybody else in the world. And so fast forward today, and it's pretty clear that it's not just Amazon that is the destination for your applications. Uh, it is actually a, you know, a plethora of, of, of cloud platforms. Now, by and large, most people are standardizing on, one, on two 
perhaps you, you may use three, but mostly it's two, but it's not always the same two. And, and if you've been curious, regionally in Australia, for example, we see a bit more Google than we do in North America. Uh, you know, in North America, you see pretty much Amazon and Azure second. In Europe, you see Azure first and then maybe Amazon second. So it is quite regionally distinct. Our thesis was, hey, the modern platform is in cloud because uh, you're not just going to be delivering applications on Amazon, whether you like it or, or not, you have to deliver applications onto Azure and Google and probably Alibaba and probably some IBM and probably some Oracle Cloud. Uh, and that is just the, the reality of the world. Why? Well, because each of these different cloud platforms has slightly different personalities. And you can see on the right, just sort of a high level snapshot, you know, thesis as to the value proposition of each of these different cloud platforms. Google's very good at the data assets, uh, technologically very advanced. Uh, Azure, you know, has, has this enormous uh, brand of trust and, uh, and incumbency for many of you that you're gonna rely on, on Azure. They've invested in the things that you care about around redundancy and security and all the things that really, really matter to you as a long-term IT partner. And so this is what the market market's landscape looks like. So we are fairly confident that the world is not cloud, it's going to multi-cloud. And so the new quote unquote platform isn't Amazon, it isn't Azure, and it isn't Google, it is multi-cloud. It's gonna be the ability to deliver applications to more than one of these cloud platforms, which is gonna be your business imperative. Uh, and as digital transformation forces you to deliver more and more applications, uh, those are gonna go onto probably one or two uh, or three cloud platforms. So. Great, the world's gonna be cloud, uh, it's gonna be multi-cloud, not really news to anybody at this point. I think it's worth just sort of double clicking on the implications of that cloud model. The world of running infrastructure goes through these transitions. You go, you know, go back uh, a couple of decades or a few decades, certainly from when I, when I was in college, mainframe was the predominant way that people ran compute. Uh, and then we had this, flip to client server, more uh, Unix based uh, in infrastructure. And that was a massive transition from one way of delivering applications to now oh, new applications are being built on, on uh, the, you know, the three tier, uh, the three tier model of infrastructure. That model of infrastructure at that point is actually quite well understood. And that's largely the model we use today. Yes, it eventually became deployed on the, on the VMs running on commodity hardware, but conceptually it's still that client server ish model. And that model is, is complicated. Like we have IP addresses, we have networks, we have firewalls, we have uh, you know, virtual machines that get spun up. It's quite complicated, but it's also well understood. And for the last 20 plus years, we've all gotten pretty good at running that infrastructure on the, on the left-hand side. The application delivery process is really oriented around delivering applications to that left-hand side picture. And that world is quite static. Now along comes Amazon as the first of the cloud providers, but ultimately everybody uh, in cloud largely works the same way. And the compute model is completely different. So rather than trying to emulate the compute model of the on-prem world, they sort of created a new compute model that actually has no bearing to the on-prem world. And it's different really in, in this core construct of rather than having fixed assets, the fixed things that are you know, IP addresses and networks and things, and things that, that I can touch and feel, Amazon created a pool of compute and onto that pool you can drop things, you can drop services. And that service could be a virtual machine, it could be a database, it could be a container, it could be an application. Um, but, but the concept is you have a pool of compute that you drop things onto. Now that that thing that you that service that you drop onto uh, onto EC2 in that case has a set of properties. It has an API to interact with it. It has an identity that defines who it can talk to, and it has a capability. It says I am a virtual, I am a database, I am a container, I am a you know an exchange server, <laughs> whatever it might be. But they're designed to move around on that pool of compute. So that's the fundamentally different model than the old model of on-prem and it is that difference that breaks everything so now all of a sudden i'm tasked with delivering applications if i'm an it organization to this new cloud platform where actually there is no network perimeter where things do move around right where things uh, are not as secure as, as they were in the old world where i could last through a network perimeter with a firewall around it so it is that shift in having to now deliver applications onto this totally different compute platform that causes the angst for all of us because we're all forced to embrace digital transformation whether we like it or not 
but that we are geared for the old world of delivering applications to the old world. So, you know, the good news is the model to run infrastructure on the right hand side is actually quite well understood as well. And that architectural blueprint was created by all the web, all the monsters that you see coming into the public markets today. People like Snowflake that you're they're about to go public, people like, uh, you know, Databricks, people like Confluent, people like, uh, um, you know, uh, Con, you know, Confluent, people, people like, like sort of the, the cloud native companies, people like Electronic Arts that are building you know, games, uh, Fortnite and all the things we use. Those are all built on cloud infrastructure and they run in this new cloud model. And that is a relatively well understood model. So what we set out to, 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 to do was to help people address what you see inside the orange here is sort of these new compute primitives and how do I interface to them so I can in a consistent, repeatable, uh, safe way, drop applications onto this new world uh, while you know, acknowledging that, that it has all these different properties. The way we think about it and the way our product portfolio fits together is we decompose it across all the personas in IT. So you think about the ops person having to interface to that new model. What used to be, hey, someone opens a ticket, I, uh, I open up uh, VRA and I provision a virtual machine and I close the ticket because it's a relatively static environment that I work with. Now I'm tasked with giving an instruction set to vSphere or giving an instruction set to Amazon to spin up a, a pool of compute and then 30 seconds later pull, spin it down again. Right? If, I'm, if, I, if I'm Zoom, <laughs> and I think Zoom's probably a great example and we're just talking about it because they reported earnings today and it's kind of stunning how fast they've grown. Zoom has an application and it needs infrastructure. The way Zoom works is they have to give an instruction set to spin up more compute capacity as, as more and more uh, people come, on, come, come online. And at the end of the day, they spin it down again, right? That's a very different way of running infrastructure than having 2 million servers just sitting idle for the peak load. So the way you, the way you provision compute to support an application like Zoom, which is just representative of, although an extreme case, a modern digital application, is a completely different model. And so the tooling that you use has to be different. At the security layer, if, if I use Zoom as an example, right, I am now spinning up a huge amount of compute capacity and my, my Zoom application may be comprised of, maybe it's three tiers, maybe it's a front end, a mid, you know, mid tier and a, and, a, and, a, and a data tier, right? Those three things co comprise my application. Every time I, provision more compute capacity after provision another instance and another instance and another instance. Well, now things are scaling so quickly that how do I update the firewall rules to allow this thing to talk to this thing in a repeatable way? It's really, really difficult. So the cloud native model, rather than using IP address as the basis of, of, of who can talk to whom, I use identity as the basis of who, who can talk to whom. So when you know, Zim spins up this, uh, this application, the containers are assigned an identity by the platform and then as long as you know, I've created a rule that says container identity can talk to database, it just happens uh, in an automated fashion. So the construct is totally different. It's identity based as opposed to IP based. Again, super well understood. And then the networking challenge, just to use Zoom as the example again, how exactly am I gonna update the firewall rules when I set up another 10,000 servers or 20,000 servers or 50,000 servers? And I know that's an extreme case, but it sort of illustrates the problem you're running on a platform that's designed to be have things come and go all the time. So the, the notion of IP based networking is really, really difficult to maintain as you have these cloud based applications that, 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 that burst and come and go. So you move to a service networking model that I just declare this service can talk to this service. And when it gets deployed, as long as that rule is enforced, and I can say the identity of this thing says it can talk to this thing, then how I connect it to each other is based on service-based networking. And again, that's a really, really well understood construct, but very different from running infrastructure in the old world. The development teams actually almost have the easiest job. You go from a world where I used to drop my application artifact onto an app server, and now I give it to a scheduler that can run across this distributed fleet. And while there's heterogeneity generally in the, the kinds of applications run that are run and different application platforms, there tends to be a one-time sort of, you know, retrenchment around how am I going to do op security and networking to support all these cloud native applications. And that is the big thematic that's going on in the market. If you look at how this manifests on the cloud providers, just to use them as an example, like take Amazon, 
these co this core construct of how do I give an instruction set to Amazon to spin up another 10,000 servers manifests in CloudFormation. So CloudFormation is a free tool that Amazon created to allow you to provision infrastructure. The way that they do security is predicated on the Amazon identity model. So when a container spins up, depending on the, on the security group that it's in, it's an assigned an identity and then I can declare who it can talk to. But security is a derivative of the identity. At the networking layer, again, the only way to support these highly bursty things, other than trying to replicate the old model of static IP addresses, which most many people do, they you know, create a virtual load balancer and a virtual firewall and try to force things into, into, uh, into, call, into um, you know, a more static orientation. The cloud native companies don't do it that way. They use service networking and, and Amazon's particular offering is called App Mesh. And so whether it's a container service or Kubernetes service or a serverless thing running on top or an edge device that needs to connect to the cloud infrastructure, that's the stack you have to work with. And to my earlier point, if you're just running on Amazon, that is a manageable stack, but none of you are. You also have on-prem infrastructure because if you're building a banking application, for example, I'm guessing your system of records probably still a mainframe running on-prem, but the front end might be a Kubernetes-based application running on Amazon. So how exactly am I gonna bridge these two worlds of op security and networking uh, in a way that actually meets the needs of you know, the digital transformation uh, push that isn't uh, gonna take forever? And you're also gonna have some stuff on other platforms and you can see each of the different platforms has their own take on this particular flavor. They have their own take on identity, their own take on service networking, their own take on provisioning, which is the role that we've played for many years. Terraform provides that consistent way to provision infrastructure, whether it's on Amazon or Azure or Google, actually anything with an API. And increasingly, we also see people using it to configure their networking gear in a, in a consistent way. We do a lot of work with Cisco, with Palo Alto Networks, with F5. So you can apply that same construct of getting an instruction set to Amazon or an instruction set to Cisco ACI to be configured in a consistent way and a repeatable way. Vault provides a way to broker identity across the different platforms, whether that's for secrets management, which is a very common use case, or whether that's for the most advanced encryption use, use cases Vault is that identity broker so that when an application on Amazon spins up and wants to connect to a database running inside of a virtual machine, you authenticate its identity through Vault and then that determines who can talk to whom. We actually just published a case study uh, this week um, uh, from Athena Health, just to give, it, give an example, where Athena Health authenticates 300 million times per day uh, through their Vault infrastructure. Every single application authenticates its identity through Vault and in so doing massively redu reduces the security exposure on it. Console is actually our most widely used product, believe it or not. Uh, console provides a common way to give me an inventory of all the services across my different environments. And then I can create rules that says container can talk to database. And every time I spin up another instance of that application, container can talk to database. It's designed to solve the networking challenge of, of cloud adoption. And I would posit that those bottom three layers are the standardization that we see happen in the market first. People say, hey, I'm gonna have different kinds of application platforms. I'm gonna have some Java apps, some .NET apps, some, some Edge apps, some Kubernetes container apps. There's heterogeneity at that green layer. But at the bottom three layers, people generally standardize because that's how you get your arms around these core concepts of like the totally different compute model of, M of, of, of the cloud platforms. Terraform for ops for provisioning, vault for identity-based security, and console for service-based networking. And you, know, you fast forward now, uh, you know, the company's been around since 2012 and we've been really operating in earnest since 2015 uh, uh, commercially. It is these products that underpin eight of the Fortune 10, you know, hundreds of the, of the global 2000, literally in the runtime path of applications that you and I all use every single day. The problem people are trying to solve ultimately, and Andrew from NAB is going to talk about how they how they use Terraform as a part of this, is you have you really have all of these four problems to solve. And they're kind of independent problems as you go cloud, but they're interrelated. You know, and generally people start with one or two, and then they realize they have the other two. And whether you use us for all four or just for one or for none, you know, it's totally your prerogative. I would posit that these are the four issues that people run into, ops, security, networking, and development. And the problem gets rendered like this. It's like, hey, I want to 
ultimately, I need to be able to deliver applications in a repeatable way onto Amazon and Azure and on-prem in a way that meets the needs of my ops security and networking teams, where I'm not just going to deploy a new application and those teams are going to shut me down and say, whoa, 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 you know that thing has no network perimeter, we're going to get, we're going to get breached, right? So how do I industrialize the application delivery process onto n number of endpoints? And I won't go into a bunch of detail here because I just really wanted to tee it up. But this is the picture by and large we see in again, eight of the Fortune 10 and hundreds of the Global 2000. They, they create a central cloud team that says, hold on a second, we're gonna create a consistent way with respect to how all the different teams inside of our company goes cloud. Uh, and that starts with a central shared service running Terraform. And now the only way you can go provision compute co capacity on Amazon or Azure is by going through the single aperture. You have to use my pre-approved template with my pre-approved agents. And then the ops team says, great, as long as you go through this single aperture, basically nothing gets to cloud without my pre-approval because I've already created the, I've codified the rules of what can go there. And they say, if you do that, you can deploy a hundred times a day. And this is what most of the cloud native companies do, right? It's like, if you were to ask GitHub and people like that, how they do this, well, this is how they do it. <laughs> you know, they use Terraform, they use Terraform Enterprise, they use these products as the basis for how they deploy GitHub 12 times a day. They also run a central shared service of of Vault and say every application going to the cloud has to get us credentials from Vault. And if so, you can deploy 100 times a day. And then they create a central shared service of, of, of console. And that's how, when something gets deployed, it automatically gets discovered and now I can route traffic to it straight away. And whether it's a Java app or .NET app or a, or a Kubernetes app or something like Nomad, there'll be a variety of application platforms on top. And I'm, I'm sure Andrew will have some commentary on the, the, the variety of services they have there. So this is largely the picture that we see inside most of our customers that end up uh, sort, of, sort of reconciling this problem, creating a common cloud foundation, and then they enable all the different business teams to go cloud. Uh, in you know, some of our bank, bigger banking cl clients, this is literally 10,000 people that they enable have access to this common uh, delivery process. I just want to maybe make one comment on the overall market because I think what's happened is the if you pot, if you kind of acknowledge that the world the new platform is multi cloud what you've seen emerge over the last seven or eight years and now you're just starting to see these companies go public and you start to get a sense for how big they are people like Snowflake is the core infrastructure categories are now being serviced by an independent vendor that is you know, of course Amazon has a data warehousing technology called Redshift. But you probably need to standardize on a data warehouse and, and you probably are going to want the ability to run on Amazon or on Azure because you have different teams. So over time, people aren't running uh, Oracle database on Amazon because it's sort of built around the old compute primitives. What they use instead is Snowflake because Snowflake is built around the new compute primitives. And so it is the appropriate tech for the new stack. And you see Databricks for the analytic use cases. You probably see Mongo for the transactional use cases. At the message layer, messaging layer, huge, obviously you guys are all huge TIBCO and MQ series uh, users over the last uh, decades. Increasingly, people are adopting streaming as the common messaging uh, paradigm for, uh, for cloud. And you see, oh, now, now you see Confluent emerging as a standard way of doing Kafka across the different platforms. And then obviously Kubernetes is enormously popular at the runtime layer for containers. My point being, there are more than containers in the world. Uh, and, but certainly Kubernetes is super, super popular there and it's been hugely helpful for the adoption of our other products. But I think by and large, Terraform, Vault and Console are what underpin op security and networking. And it's ironic to me that if you look at this picture, the companies on, at the top of this stack, they're built on Terraform, Vault and Console. Like they, they're, they're sort of, there's a truth to it. It's like the, the, the cloud native companies themselves are built this way for their cloud services, because this is the logical way to do it. So I'll leave that there, just because I think it's an interesting way to just contextualize where, uh, where our products fit in the market and the standardization by and large has happened over the last uh, eight, nine years while we've, we've been pursuing it. I'm gonna hand things off to Michael. Um, if there's you know, three takeaways, really it's these ones. It's, hey, this multi-cloud is, is, is an inevitability and the, the com compute primitives of cloud require you to basically do the step back and go, hold on a second, how am I going to reconcile op security, net security and networking across the different cloud providers are going to run? 
and just know that these models are very well understood. They're running at enormous, enormous, enormous scale. The single biggest customer, just, just because it's interesting, that I've seen uh, running Vault uh, has 60 million clients that connect every day to Vault. It's an IoT endpoint uh, application. Takeaway is the tech is really well <laughs> understood at a really, really enormous scale. It is an operating model that is a bit different from most uh, traditional companies that they're not as familiar with. It's not a tech problem for how to make it work. I'll leave there. I'll stop there. I'll hand over to Michael, but happy to answer any questions and really appreciate you all taking a few minutes to, uh, to connect with us today. So Michael, over to you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Dave. Perfect. Is everybody looking at the uh, trends slide deck? Yep, looks good. Okay. Awesome. Well, uh, good morning. Uh, I believe it's it's in the evening over here, and uh, but uh, wonderful to get the chance to spend some time with you today. Uh, this particular section, we're going to dig in a little bit to what we're seeing in terms of the uh, financial services and kind of where the trends are in terms of experience and new new ways that fintech is serving end users. We're going to talk about how those trends are kind of lending themselves towards a optimal leverage of kind of cloud native infrastructure and how HashiCorp is helping some of these firms uh, advance into the new world. So some of the things that really makes this interesting for us is that FinTech tends to lead in a lot of areas. Obviously, there's not much more important than uh, your financial security long term. And so a lot of serving our clients, everything becomes a financial transaction in some form or fashion. There's always an exchange of value that's taking place. And so a lot of these technical trends tend to manifest themselves, especially in edge use cases and financial services. Um, I'm stealing a, a, a little bit of an adage that comes out of uh, stock trading that the trend is your friend. So if you see a trend, it's typically pretty solid advice to to go with the market when the market is in a in a bull scenario, let's let's go ahead and go long in a bull scenario, and then go short when it reverses. Right? I'm, I it's not typically profitable to bet against the trend. So let's let's establish what some of the trends are in fintech and how we can kind of capitalize on those. And then to Dave's point, the primitives have shifted not only in the tech sector but also in the uh, the fintech sector. How are things changing in finance? So just to touch on a few of these things, and I know I'm probably not introducing a ton of new information here, but one of the cool things that's happening is the ability to use data in a more effective and efficient manner, and then also capitalizing on the fact that there's more sources of data, interesting uh, sources of data that I can use to deliver new engagements and experiences for my customers. Uh, this allows me to get very predictive. I can start using things like machine learning and AI to do advisory services on, on positions in terms of your investing portfolio. I can take existing customers that are not profitable today and, and begin to influence their behavior to make them progressively more profitable if I can do these kinds of things right. And, and it, it's all based on my ability to understand my customer well and to serve them in unique ways and advise them in unique ways to drive more profitable transactions and obviously uh, also establish deeper trust with those individuals uh, by, by understanding their behavior. So things like telemetry on, on cell phones and things like that gives us a really interesting new way to engage. Um, and our goal here is to capitalize on those things. Some examples that we see materialize are things like Tencent WeChat and Alipay, I'm sure you're, you're familiar with uh, some of this that's been happening in your region of the world. Uh, the, the interesting thing about something like WeChat, uh, as an example, is that it becomes a, a sort of a de facto bank because they recognized very early on that social networking is actually some, a form of exchange. So why can't we uh, exchange financially while on a social uh, platform? And the, what we see happening there, especially in China, in the Chinese markets, is uh, people buy almost everything through WeChat and the funds after a transaction takes place rarely go back or less and less often are going back to the financial institution where the money was originally drafted. 
And so effectively you have an account on WeChat, which is loaded with money like a, like a wallet. And effectively you have sort of a checking account that you're running live uh, all the time. Anything that you run across on WeChat and you want to act on it, uh, you, simply, uh, you simply act on it. Some of the things that are interesting there is the identity level of uh, attestation that's going on. So we're, we kind of see a future coming in FinTech where we have such a good lock on the identity of the individual who is requesting a form of transaction that I really don't need a 16 digit credit card to understand what this person can, that we are going to extend credit to, uh, is able to draft against our accounts. So if I'm able to identify, that I have a funny story. I met um, General Powell um, one time at a, at a big event, he was speaking uh, and he was asked, what he loved most about being Secretary of State of the United States. And he laughed and said it was his airplane. You know, he would go to the airport, a car would take him right to the plane, he would get on, Secret Service agent would set a Diet Coke down on the, on the table in front of him, would talk into the airpiece and say, the Diet Coke is down, and they were wheels up moving to the next city. He said, now that he's not Secretary of State anymore, he'll be in the airport and he'll be getting a pat down, um, you know, going through security. And the person who is patting him down is saying, uh, you know, uh, General Powell, I, I'm a big fan. I've read your, I've read, you know, about you. I understand you're, and he, and he's standing there getting pat down and he says, uh, well, if you know that I'm General Powell, you know, why am I getting a pat down? And that's kind of how our customers feel when we're constantly uh, getting them to attest their identity. If you know who I am, if you have 30 years of transactional history, because you've been my bank for the last 30 years, why are you asking me questions about credit worthiness again? Why do I have to produce tax filings and documents? You, you've seen all the ins and outs of my account. You know that I pay my bills on time. You know, like there's a lot of information that we already have. And if you already understand that, why are we asking these questions again and again and again? So that level of identity is really coming to the fore in, in terms of a lot of financial uh, transactions. It's also something that we see in IT as, as identity is becoming sort of the core way that we handle everything from networking to security to credentialing, et cetera, et cetera. We're getting a really tight uh, rein on individual identity and using it to assert value, you know, to provide additional services and reduce the friction associated with things like access to accounts, to credit, to, to whatever it is that we're serving our clients with. The other thing that I'm calling out on this slide is the fact that pretty much anyone uh, can become a financial services company uh, fairly quickly. Now, I know regulations are different depending on region, but especially what we're seeing in the U.S. is, uh, as an example, was uh, Uber. So Uber was growing extremely fast. Uh, they were trying to recruit drivers and they found that drivers were abandoning their application at a very specific point in time, and that was enter your bank account information here. And a lot of the folks that were driving either didn't have bank accounts or didn't want to expose, didn't want the exposure of, of handing bank account information to an outside entity. And so what Uber decided to do was become a financial services company. And they created Basically, when you sign up to be an Uber driver, they create an account for you and they pay you direct deposit to their own financial services account and they issue you a card to access that information. You can transfer that out to your own bank. But in the meantime, Uber can make up a little bit of margin on ride sharing profits, as an example, uh, by uh, charging a little bit against their financial services they're providing to their drivers. It actually solved a couple of things for them. One is they were able to onboard the drivers that they needed. And the second thing that it did was actually improve the stickiness of the drivers that stayed with Uber. So if I have a financial, if I have an account with you and I, maybe I haven't had a checking account in the past, I do now and Uber's the one that provides it and I'm going to you know, continue to build a line of credit through, uh, through the accounts that Uber has provided me. So a lot of really interesting things are happening there. And then you have kind of brand loyalty programs like Apple Pay where it's, it's more of a lifestyle, it's a brand extension. It's a way to help me remain central to everything that you do. You know, you buy my watch because you, you can pay with the watch and you can have an Apple account and financial services through Apple, et cetera. So we're seeing a lot of disintermediation there. 
a lot of folks are becoming uh, financial services companies. It used to be that only very, very large corporations, and, and naturally both of these companies now are very large as well, but like uh, auto manufacturers, Ford Finance is an example, is, is one of the ways that we provide financial services in order to smooth the transaction. I wanna sell more cars, I understand that they're very expensive, so maybe I can establish a bank, multi-billion dollar financial services in, uh, industry that I get additional margin on by smoothing the, uh, the, the auto loan industry. So those are some of the things that I you know, would call out in terms of uh, helping us to look at what trends are coming about. The other thing that's very interesting is, at least in the States, we're seeing some pretty strong disintermediation of the core banking system, so the startup costs of becoming a financial services institution. So typically, it's a couple of year process to get licensed. Uh, you can shorten that maybe by half by negotiating with an existing bank and borrowing a license and paying for that privilege. You typically are standing up some form of ERP uh, that's a core banking system. Uh, you need a payment network. You need uh, so relationships with Visa and MasterCard and whoever else it is that you, that's going to provide card services for you. You need data, that's credit histories, Experian, TransUnion, you know, those types of entities. Uh, you need to deal with fraud regulation. You need to adhere to all the governmental demands that are, that are incumbent there to be a, a solvent bank. Uh, and then finally, once you have all of these things in place, you can actually develop an experience or a UI or some, some form of engagement that you can have with your customer. Uh, and, and traditionally, this has been a very high bar. It's very, been very difficult for banks to enter into a market when this is the heavy lift associated. But there are a lot of firms that are coming into, um, into view, especially in, in the US, where we have companies like Plaid, which I think uh, Visa recently bought, which basically abstracts away or is providing as a service the bottom four rungs. The stated, the stated goal of both Synapse and Plaid was to democratize banking, to provide banking as a service. So they're going to provide those core money movement services, access to a payment network, all of these things have already been negotiated and you can transact or you can use our services to provide a full bank experience uh, by, by paying per use sort of approach, right? It, it doesn't require this massive startup. In fact, you can get out on the cloud write a few hundred lines of code and deliver a new banking experience to a customer. And then even the governmental regulation and fraud detection are, are being disintermediated as well by firms like Comply Advantage and CentiLink, which go out and provide specific fraud detection and analytics against the transactions and banking that you're providing. And you can pay for that as a service. So they, it turns out that uh, one form of fraud is, is synthetic fraud where you pretty much in the US, you have nine digit uh, social security numbers. Basically, if you pick a, a, a random social security number, uh, it, it's going to hit. You're going to you know, just make up the, the numbers, send it in and request a loan. And typically what happens is you'll see that there's no credit history, the, cr the loan is immediately denied and you move on. Well, in a synthetic, uh, fraud situation, I simply file it again. And the second time it, I ask for a loan, it says, no, there is a credit history. Someone with this credit card, some, someone with the social security number has requested a loan in the past. Maybe we'll extend a $50 credit for something. And then they use that money to pay it back and then they file again. And they continue to do that until they get the loan big enough and then they walk. With the money. So that form of fraud is actually, if you know what you're looking for in terms of pattern of request, in terms of what I'm seeing in the data, the ability to determine what that fraud is, I, you can get it and you can find it pretty easily if you know what you're looking for. And so by subscribing or commissioning the help of somebody like a CentiLink or a Comply Advantage, which looks for money laundering, uh, I, can, I can get these services on top of a core banking platform, and now I can meet government regulation standards for fraud detection, anti-money laundering, antitrust, et cetera, simply by subscribing to a handful of services and writing a few hundred lines of code. And then you see these experiences come out of that, things like uh, Earnin. So Earnin's an interesting company here that does uh, payday loans. 
And so for a lot of hourly workers, uh, day wage uh, style workers, um, there are times when, hey, the, the car payment is due and I'm not getting paid until next Friday. I'd like to get an advance. And typically, these types of loans have been a little bit loan sharkish. You know, there's a some some place on the side of the road that's offering, you know, 27% interest on a short-term loan and you need to come pay us back or there's going to be a big penalty. And that penalty is really there because it's a very, it's typically considered a very high risk kind of engagement. Well, Earnin sort of de-risks it by running an app on the phone and you opt in to allow us to track your phone's location. And I can see that your phone is in the locker at the Amazon warehouse or where, wherever it is that you're working. And so I can watch and I can see how many hours you've racked up and I can completely de-risk the payback of the loan to the point that Earnin will provide payday loans for customers for tips only. They don't even charge, for, charge a fee. So you're kind of seeing some, some industries that were considered a little bit shady, not maybe shady is the wrong word, but you get the idea. It's, it's kind of like a really high interest for short-term loans and really converting it to kind of an above board, open kind of experience uh, that is incredibly pleasing to the folks who use that service. Then you have companies like Blend. Blend is more like a, think of it as, as loan, making loan processing super easy. If you give us access to your data, Blend will essentially determine your credit worthiness uh, pretty much overnight and sort of predictively say you can qualify for this much of a, lo of a loan and, and provide you with the opportunity to do things like get a mortgage without multiple years of tax filings and, and you know, have the, have the tax authority send us this document and show us your birth certificate. So all the, all the stuff that typically goes into kind of larger loan processing, their, their goal is to kind of drive all of that out and make it completely seamless. So these types, and then Mercury is more of that, that uh, challenger bank type, or small new bank, uh, that entire goal, everything they sell on is the fact that we go much, much faster. We're going to evolve with you. We're gonna provide you services that you ask for in record time. Traditional banks can't keep up with us. So entrust us because we, we care for you in ways that, uh, that the legacy banks you know, just can't. So those are the kinds of things that we're seeing kind of come into play. And naturally, this is, you know, US, obviously. I know uh, legislation is going to be a little bit different in different places, but these types of innovations are coming. Software allows us to remove the starting cost, the starting friction of launching into new experiences. And a lot of what we do with HashiCorp is to help uh, existing enterprises reduce their barrier of entry. And when I say barrier of entry, I'm not saying from a network, you, you may have, you may be a very, very large bank with branch offices everywhere and you feel like you can reach any market and, and you can. But when it comes to innovation and delivering a new experience that somebody really loves, like a payday loan app or something that's, that's interesting and new and can draw new uh, markets to you, what is the overarching cost to deliver that application? Right? Is there a lot of friction associated with rolling that out? And so HashiCorp, as we look at that cloud operating model that Dave talked about, is, is here to kind of bring that cloud operating model as, as kind of an innovation engine or weapon for you to wield to provide a safe environment to drop new experiences like these into your customers to, uh, to create new opportunities for revenue. Stripe is one of those payment uh, providers that uses uh, the HashiCorp product set to, uh, to drive results. So what we're seeing is the principles in, in financial services, at least in, in the regions that I spend a lot of time in, are, are kind of shifting away from that ground up build out to more of as a service cloud-based uh, kind of experiences. Uh, where locations were a, a, a huge bit of a, a piece of strength, the way that a bank would differentiate itself was number of locations, access to, uh, to lobbies and, and bankers and things like that. It's much more about the digital experience. Uh, millennials are not really interested in, in the handshake uh, friendship with the loan officer that is working with them as much as, as uh, older generations were. So it's really a different form of engagement. Uh, rather than financial um, things like loan processing and everything being completely out of band of, of the activity that I'm involved with, 
banking and financial services really is becoming is going to become ubiquitous wherever i am my buying power is also and i don't have to stop go home get in open the filing cabinet pull out 12 documents and then try to justify why you know why i'm credit worthy in this particular case except for for example and then size and network is becoming less important as digital reach is is kind of obfuscating the need to have uh, you know a branch on every corner uh, one of the things that we've actually seen is a difference between what we would call kind of those disruptors, like the, the earn-ins, the, the companies like that that are just going right at a particular experience and trying to uh, pull down a market with it. Are the banks typically start with like recreating the branch experience? You know, when you come into the app, it should be like you came into a branch and then you would, you would be able to deposit checks, you can, you know, um, do a withdrawal. You can do all of these kinds of things that you would typically do in the branch. And so a lot of those early designs for mobile apps for the banking industry were essentially recreated lobbies of, you know, a branch location. Um, typically the innovators are, are saying that's not, you know, it, let's pretend the branch never existed. What are customers actually trying to do and how do we provide services in the flow of that traffic? And that's where those, those innovators are spending their time. Um, and it's not just those innovators, obviously, there's lots of really interesting new uh, new experiences that are coming from the the large multinational banking bankers as well. Uh, I'm just using that to kind of draw the distinction of iterative thinking versus disruptive thinking. It's very much like looking at how Tesla, when they built their electric cars, didn't start from a combustion engine. They started with, if we were going all electric, what would this look like? So a lot of what we're asking uh, you to do is you think through who, where you want to go and what you want to do next in terms of innovation. Maybe it's, you know, kind of pretend the bank doesn't exist. What is the experience that's going to really transform the way that a particular user base sees us, engages with us and, and behaves. And then we're seeing this shift to identity. I mentioned this before, but uh, I've got biometrics. I've got your phone is traveling in the same areas that it always does. So I feel pretty sure that that's you. Um, you know, it, it, those types of forms of other forms of attestation that I can pull from your mobile device, from your watch, from your car, from all of these different things that I can I can kind of latch on to from in terms of telemetry and identity and and understanding that this is in fact you when you go to ask me for something is a way that I can kind of serve you serve you better. Account numbers were, you know, kind of a mainframe asset that helped the computer understand how to deal with uh, in independent users. So it, it, as, as we finish kind of shift away from kind of what's happening in the financial services industry and, and we talk a little bit, I'll just reset for a second on how Dave was talking about the disintermediation in tech. This is the same disintermediation that we have gone through in the software industry. So instead of building, you know, buying a small warehouse, uh, buying a few hundred thousand dollars worth of servers, standing it from the ground up, buying an Oracle software stack for more than the servers, you know, once, once we've done all of that and built up that baseline stack, we were then able to start building applications on top of it and, and pushing them out to our end users. Well, cloud and the cloud operating model that we've been talking about has completely removed that barrier to entry to release new softwares or software uh, solutions and, and uh, experiences. And pretty much anybody can become a software company. If they have a great idea and I can write a few hundred lines of code on Amazon, uh, I don't have to pay a lot upfront. I don't have a lot of startup friction. I can release new experiences in real time. So a lot of folks that have been moving from traditional, more static assets to the cloud, it's because of the ability to self-serve and drive much more dynamic iterations. So some of the challenges that we see, and I'll just run through these really quickly and then give you a couple of closing thoughts so we can get over to, uh, to Andrew. Um, really determine what your focus is. Determine what it is that you want. Are you going to be, are you going to automate a thin layer and then give a lot of flexibility to the developers? That's, that's normally where a lot of companies will start is they will automate the core base core functionality and then they'll, they'll steal a little bit of a, from the book of Netflix that says, you build it, you run it, right? You're responsible. If something breaks, it's on you. You're the one who's going to get the call because I'm responsible for a relatively thin layer of the infrastructure and operations. Or 
are you going to become uh, more like a Silicon Valley style uh, company like Google, as an example, where operations automates everything about the stack and you have, as, as Dave referred to it, a, a fairly restricted aperture through which if your code goes through that aperture, it's completely dynamic. The beautiful part about having more this later stage approach to automation, where you have very codified infrastructure, codified approaches to networking, everything is very highly uh, automated, but also best practice is you're providing sort of that psychological security required to drive innovation. If you empower developers, but give them massive choice, and then you put them on the hook, if they violate a security principle, or they know an audit's coming at the end of this, and they could be exposed, you are going to kind of grind those gears of innovation down because the developers are going to be looking over their shoulder for the audit. And I hope I'm doing this right. I've never done mutual TLS before, but now I need to understand PKI and X509 certs, et cetera, et cetera. Things that maybe I didn't think of before when I was just writing code and then tossing it into the test uh, group and then networking did their thing and, and the typical ITIL ITSM processes. And so one of the things that we're looking to fundamentally shift here as we, we, we believe that a lot of customers are looking to become more empathetic and more highly automated towards their value creating developers. And a lot of times when we're talking about interacting between groups via a ticket queue, that's often a little bit of a less empathetic sort of engagement, right? Tickets are kind of there to buffer a group from the deluge of, of asks that are going to be coming, and then also provide a way for us to measure how that team is progressing. But what we're seeing at HashiCorp and the approach that we're looking to drive is to create more of a system of coordination or collaboration where operations and compliance and development can kind of negotiate on here are the assets that we're typically using. Can you sort of pre-compliance check all of these pieces so that every time I call them, they just snap into existence and I know they're going to meet all the policy and I have that psychological safety I need to drive innovation, right? So holistic, I'm giving you a little bit of like the philosophy behind it, but as you chart your path in terms of digital transformation, you, you need to think through what is the culture that I really want? Do I want to set developers completely free, but give them a whole bunch of risk uh, as, we, as we do that? Or do I want to kind of restrict the aperture down to a handful of ways that things can get deployed? But if they follow these, they're 100% safe. You know, we've 100%, obviously, there's, there's still going to be breaches, but we're going to be much better on blast radius on our exposure. You know, everything's going to be follow through kind of a standardized method of uh, deployment. So I'd say, let's get really clean on that. Avoid bullet, boiling the ocean, determine if there's a new experience that you want to drive and drive it in a new way. You're going to need to learn as you go. And then as you, as you begin to move, you really need to be communicating holistically down through the, uh, through the organization. What are the expectations? What are we shooting for? Why is this such a big um, initiative for us? And I'll get to kind of why that is as we as we go a little further. And the other thing is, is as you start picking software stacks, understand that these are culture decisions, right? Um, there's often a uh, predilection to to uh, procure software that feels comfortable to your existing processes, right? And so as leaders, as you look at the culture that you're looking to drive, you you may need to pick some solutions that are a little bit uncomfortable because it pushes us towards where we want to be rather than makes us feel comfortable where we are, if that makes sense. So understand the cultural impact of the software that you're procuring and make sure it's driving you towards the, the outcome that you want. And then iterating from where you are can be counterproductive. That's what I was talking about. Consider the experience first, not uh, what you currently do. And I'll I'll pretty much wrap on this slide, but the, the intent is as we look at an overarching organization, we may have um, innovation with compliance as, let's say innovation is our number one thing. We're trying to provide an environment where the cost of experimentation is so low and the level of safety is so high that we can bring developers in and the first day, second day, third day, within the first week, they're providing value in terms of delivering new experiences and driving new revenue for the company. Okay, well, that sounds awesome, but is that really possible? Is that really a possibility? 
Well, a lot of Silicon Valley companies like Etsy and, and Google and Facebook and others make sure that new developers deliver code to production the first week on the job. And that's really a retention thing. It's a talent acquisition thing and it's a retention thing to say, hey, we're gonna provide safety that allows you to innovate. And as long as you're with us, you can deliver value. And we're going to empower you and we're gonna provide the safety rails that allow you to move very, very quickly. So let's say as the bank, our goal is to move IT holistically into this world where innovation is not a risky proposition. Um, then we will have sort of a uh, we have to sort of distribute that intent and, and we may bucket this as developer productivity with fences, right? Let me provide you with the safe environment for innovation to take place. Then operations, as Dave was showing you the different layers of the, of the uh, stack as, as IT provides those services, we'll look at operations and we'll, we'll issue kind of the overarching goal of automate the delivery of infrastructure, but do it compliant with compliance in mind with cost restrictions with compliance, right? Everything needs to be very well defined and pre-approved for usage so that we know we're not getting, you know, a misconfigured WAF in, in Amazon that leads to an $80 million fine by the government. So how do I establish a good practice where they come through this aperture, they get infrastructure dynamically provisioned, they have the safety they need so they can proceed with being innovative. And then we can kind of go through the organizational slices and say, now, how do we do this with, with networking? Well, DNS assignment can't take three days if I'm trying to release five, 15 new applications a day or, or whatever that is. So how do I automate the delivery of DNS? It might be through some form of registry. It might be, you know, like the, we start asking these automation questions. The same thing would be true of security. If I'm going to consume, uh, if I want to provide a best practice approach to mutual TLS you know, PKI X509, if I want to provide a core service that removes all that extra think work uh, from the developers, then I may need to have a centralized service that around identity uh, and, and I can call into that and I can get encryption when I ask for it and I get mutual TLS and get a certificate of management, life cycle of my secrets, etc. So at any rate, this is an idea of like, if you look at the organization, how might we goal them? And then what would be some of the measures and or goals, objectives that would fall out of, of this type of an ask, of this type of an approach? Um, so I'm going to, obviously our products fit into these spaces, uh, but I want to make sure that we get plenty of time to talk about this in, in actuality with uh, a customer of ours. So I'll leave you with these thoughts. Oftentimes when we're working with large scale uh, organizations, especially highly regulated organizations, these tend to be the key initiatives that they're looking at as they, as they guide through their digital transformation. And as we think about things like defense posture holistically, preventing breach, keeping trust, not only with our end users, but with government, uh, government uh, compliance, et cetera, uh, I have to think very holistically. It's, it's great if I can manage my secrets really well and have encryption and have transparent data encryption on the disk and, and, and encryption in motion, et cetera. But I also have to consider how things are getting provisioned. Am I leaving openings through configuration missteps? Am I, am I handling my perimeter well? Are my firewalls all up to date? Do I trust that my five and a half million firewall rules are what they need to be? Or is it possible for an attacker to get in through one node and trace through my uh, branch all the way back to corporate in order to siphon off account numbers. How am I segmenting all of this? So defense posture extends to most everything. And then that helps us shift that uh, shift over to more innovation because I can provide that greater level of safety. And then we're also looking at this because if you've, as you move to the cloud, there's literally, I don't know, an infinite number of pieces of technology. They're emerging every day that you can consume to help you along your path. HashiCorp is really focused on these four key workflows, right? Provisioning, security, and connectivity, uh, as well as uh, scheduling. Think about a, a application rollouts as a scheduled event. Uh, and so our goal here is to kind of simplify this move by codifying those workflows associated with delivery of your underlying technology. So I'll stop there. I appreciate the time. I think I, I kind of ran, uh, ran through it a little bit uh, longer just because I, I get all philosophical on this stuff. 
Uh, but I appreciate the time. Uh, I'll stick around afterwards for to answer any questions you may have. But uh, let me turn it over. Andrew. Thanks, Michael. Uh, if you just uh, yes, sir. Uh, let me share my screen. Uh, no, hopefully everyone can see that. Um, hi, my name's Andrew Bryden. So I'm from National Australia Bank. Uh, and I'm here to talk a little bit about uh, our cloud journey in the last uh, couple of years and some of the steps we've been taking. There's, there's some things that are really resonating quite well with uh, what Michael was talking about there when he was referring to um, uh, the, the two different models, the you build it, you run it versus the, uh, the, the Google model. I think, I think um, that, that's something that, that, that's a, a bit of a journey for us in terms of how we're uh, hopefully transitioning from from one to another and and I'll talk a bit a little bit about that uh, um, my role in, in the bank as a, a distinguished engineer is really to to focus on uh, on the engineers in the organization and make sure they're they're um, they're uh, functioning optimally in terms of uh, delivering our our customer uh, outcomes and features um, if you're not familiar with with NAB um, we, we're a 160-year-old company, so we, it means we carry a lot of uh, carry a lot of legacy and, and process, and, and um, uh, I guess a, a bit of baggage as well to then around our, our applications and, and how we've functioned and, and the you know the IP we've built up for, over the years. Uh, we've um, we're Australia's largest business bank, uh, and um, obviously we're operating under unusual circumstances here in Melbourne and, and, and Australia, but, uh, you know, it's, it's something we've, um, we've been maintaining over that time and, and really looking, looking after our, our 9 million customers. So in terms of our technology footprint, um, so we run around, you know, just over 2000 applications, um, in the bank, uh, across, you know, around 11,000 servers. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of, a lot of interaction, a lot of complexity, there um, and part of our journey has been um, r really in, in 2017, 2018, flipping our mindset from uh, being a, uh, a, a cloud, um, a, a cloud is an additional option for our technology delivery to being a cloud first organization. Uh, and we, um, it, it is about the journey uh, we we were uh, we were heavily outsourced. Um, we've been um, busily changing the the approach to uh, technology and application management for the organisation, uh, and cloud offers us that opportunity to do that in a you know in a um, heavily automated way, uh, and really move to a model where we can we can have our software delivery updates really focused on on achieving that business supporting customer uh, feature first uh, enablement when we were facing a number of challenges um, uh, you know risk risk for us um, is uh, is a heavy you know uh, it's a board um, reported activity in terms of our technology footprint and we spend a significant portion of our time looking at uh, understanding and dealing with the the, the the technical risk we carry in the organization and and we saw this cloud and and migrating to cloud as a key enabler of of reducing significantly reducing that so we think about that in the context of uh if, if i ever green the the infrastructure for um, our applications that's something i never have to think of again in terms of a of a, of a risk to our organization um, and then as we started scaling up our application migrations, um, were, we, were we able to uh, really do that fast enough to ensure we meet our goals and the benefits that we see or are, are, are sure that are in cloud? And how do we maintain um, migrating uh, those applications? So we've been quite uh, public around our partnerships with various organizations. So we work with heavily with um, AWS and, and um, Microsoft around the Azure platform. Uh, and we've put in place some strategies to support doing that work. 
Uh, and and of course the customer is key to to this. So how do we ensure that um, the work that we do when we're going through this transformation is 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 supporting uh, creating a much better customer experience? And we see that we we see that almost every system that we move to cloud creating a better resiliency support for our customer base. Um, so there's there's a clear benefit there. Um, uh, and when we talk about um, uh, operating our environment, how do we support these applications? We, we're, as I mentioned before, we're, we were a heavily uh, outsourced organization. How do we um, ensure that that um, we, we create a different operating environment for these applications when we when we move them into cloud, and, and how how have we ensured that? Uh, and then um, we we also uh, thanks like to put have processes in place around how we do things. How do we ensure that we we avoid uh, having any bottlenecks in terms of um, moving these systems and, and applications into the cloud? Um, part of that for us and, and part of the risk process has been having a multi-cloud strategy and and working with the with working with the HashiCorp team around their tools that support both of these environments has, has been a key enabler. Uh, of supporting that aspect to um, NAV looking at moving into more than one cloud provider. Uh, and also, um, that's also a risk perspective for us as well. We, 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 we use two cloud providers to, to ensure we have, we have options around our applications um, in the event that, that we really need to, 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 to look, at, um, look at doing something uh, in case of a, a drastic activity, um, what we what we also found, and just building a little bit on the on the build that you run it as we moved apps to cloud, that was the model we definitely used with our teams. So they had a they had cloud accounts, they had um, the the application teams very much to come that uh, thick slice um, rather than the thin slice out of uh, developing and managing on top of the cloud environment, and we heavily invested in in, in the AWS platform um, for a long time to support doing that. Uh, and it created actually it's, it's a, a fantastic thing to do from a, an innovation perspective, and and, and it was uh, hugely beneficial in our organisation. But what happened is that uh, we actually um, found that. Uh, there was um, there there was a number of uh, comp like complexities with this approach. So uh, the the teams were individually building same components for the cloud and applications on the cloud in slightly different ways. Uh, teams borrow from each other, of course, all the time, but um, they take things, they fork them, and they they update them, and. Um, we found that this lack of standardization is actually could actually inhibit some of the the speed to delivery. Sometimes it also has some other knock-on um, impacts. So actually, um, moving engineers between teams can become harder. So there's a retraining element that's involved in doing that. So we came up nine months ago. We we started looking at this, and um, we we came up with this approach, which is uh, we refer to as the NAB Engineering Foundation where we created a standard set of boot camps where we put teams through um, de developing infrastructure as code with Terraform, um, uh, developing a, on Java and JavaScript and, and containers on a uh, templated container services platform that each team can deploy into, into their accounts. It's always the same, uh, and it, it means that we do a lot of heavy lifting for the teams and, and shift them into focusing on software development for new customer features. Now, and one of the other benefits of this is that we, we provide them a, 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 or take care of a lot of their compliance elements. Being a bank, compliance is something that is very much top of mind. Um, and. Um, we use we provide them a, a CI/CD um, pipeline as a standard. We build on top of Jenkins' templating engine to to provide that, uh, 
and um, we've we've been working and and we developed this actually as an internal product. So it's uh, multiple different components of technical capabilities that we pre-integrate to provide this development template for all development teams to use within our organization. The other element to this is we 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 didn't want to have a central capability that was also a bottleneck to potentially innovating on new capabilities to come into this platform over time. So we use uh, an open source or inner source approach within the organization. And that means that any team can provide updates and, and contribute updates into this, into this capability. And we see, uh, we do a release of our internal product every two weeks. We see 50% of those um, elements that are available in each release as external contributions. And um, we took this inner source approach when we started looking at, uh, as we move into multi-cloud and we think about what things need to be true uh, and how can we support having a standard way to deploy our infrastructure, um, we, we um, implemented um, Terraform Enterprise to support this standard, standardized heavy lifting of deployment of infrastructure and bearing in mind that we are a heavily regulated organization uh, TFE also allows us to build in um, an element of our compliance uh, requirements so via Sentinel uh, and Terraform modules are actually also open source within our organization so uh, you can see on the screen we have a github um, organization which contains all the reusable Terraform modules for the teams to be able to deploy within their workspaces. Um, and, uh, you know, I'll, I'll give you an example of recently how effective this can be. We, we needed to mu move to a new version um, uh, of um, modules for um, Azure. So we, in NAB, you can only deploy um, Azure environments via, via TFE. That's um, something we've done uh, as a standard. Um, we needed to update 40 modules uh, at once and, and via this kind of inner sourcing crowdsource model that we have, we could do that within a few days. Uh, and um, it gives us a, 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 the flexibility that we need to uh, support an enterprise the size and scale of NAB with thousands of engineers, but also the compliance and, and control we need to ensure that we're doing things one way, same way, and uh, every you know, whenever we deploy infrastructure, it's in line with our security and compliance standards. Um, that's the that's the last line. Also, here is kind of the strap line around inner source. Is if you know if if you need it, don't wait for someone else or try and get someone else to build it. You change it and you contribute it back into the the, the central capability for everyone else to use. Um, and we see in the inner source model as a key thing to being able to to, to scale um, anything in terms of uh, modern software development in an organization like ours. Um, so what are the benefits? Uh, I've named a couple of the benefits here, but, but in terms of the, the technical benefits, uh, we we use TFE that uh, gives us our, our, our state management capability central, centrally uh, and um, ensures that uh, we're also tied into, tied into our internal um, software repositories, as I talked about, uh, and that allows, um, allows everyone to have a perspective on the infrastructure's code that's being deployed uh, and can look at how they can reuse that in their um, their piece of the organization. We use the policy as code elements of, of TFE uh, and um, via Sentinel. Uh, and um, just to give you a perspective on how uh, we look at services in the cloud, we, we don't simply adopt every service that becomes available. We actually have, a go, we go through an internal cycle with our security teams around whether it meets specific uh, security reply requirements, specifically looking at things like uh, data loss or potential data loss. Um, do we, you know, uh, um, and uh, 
we, we configure our our infrastructure as code modules to conform to the security standards. It means we only look at or work with a subset of the cloud services. Uh, and um, this the, the the policy modules within Sentinel allow us to work within the constraints of the services that we um, we can deploy. Uh, and also ensures that the controls that our security team need to see in place are automatically applied uh, each time any infrastructure is deployed. Now, uh, this also provides us with an easy audit capability with a central, a central place to see how all of our infrastructure is deployed and ensure it is deployed one way, same way. And then we use, uh, we use workspaces which are, are mapped into our applications so we know that the, the compliance of all of our each of our applications and we can easily provide that um, provide that to any kind of any of our audit uh, teams when they're asked when they ask them the other element not on here is is a piece of work that we've been doing recently around uh, as we as we look across our multi-cloud journey how do we um, deal with um, security certificates uh, authentication authorization um, those elements that um, get get more complicated to provide in a, a consistent way, uh, and we've been looking at implementing, or we, we're almost complete with implement, implementing Vault as our uh, multi-cloud um, uh, secrets uh, solution. So this provides us a, a consistent way for teams to. Uh, access secrets via pipelines and other methods, uh, and um, helps us with things like certificate updates. Um, the the thing that I think causes potentially more outages anywhere in the world is a, a certificate um, certificate revocation event um, or a non renewed certificate. So that's something that it, that is a, a key enabler for us to, in terms of avoiding minor or even major outages potentially um, in the future. Now I I, I um. I touched on TFE and, and Vault and, and a number of other things. I just wanted to talk briefly around what is what is the journey that um, or where are we in terms of our journey of our uh, supporting our, our developers. So I mentioned that, that NEF is uh, available as a product for teams to uh, download and deploy in our environment. You know, 50,000 downloads is not the same as the the number of downloads of console that that Dave mentioned earlier on, but you know we we'll, we aspire to that number. Um, but in in nine months we have shifted uh, nearly 300 of our internal applications on the cloud onto this model, um, and that means that uh, as we add new security compliance and automation steps into each product release. They are made available to the teams as part of a simple upgrade. So the, uh, the, the, the productivity benefits are, are massive for each of the software delivery teams. And it means that they don't have to think about a lot of these elements as part of their delivery. They're taken care of, care of for them. So we, um, I can add some, add some color here around things that we've just been adding over as, over time. So uh, automating all of our compliance elements that are not just the infrastructure, but also about the application itself. So an example of that would be, um, is my application always configured to use TLS 1.2? Um, uh, is um, is my uh, is my application uh, uh, running in with high availability? These are some of the elements or some of the examples around uh, things that we can build in and, and ensure happen uh, as part of the product. We um, we we've we've run um, we've run a series of uh, or, you know a number of boot camps now internally to train up our engineers to work in this. Um, kind of standard approach, uh, as that was a key enabler. I think that's something that um, Michael mentioned before. You, you have to train people on how to do things to ensure that you know they 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 know what to do. And um, 
and we've seen that as one of our key pillars to enable this in our organization. Um, so that's a two-day training course that we do. We run that with any new engineer that joins the bank, they go through this training. Um, and, and how we do that is, it's probably a bit big brother, but um, as soon as someone is registered in GitHub, we, um, we, we send them an email to, to have them looped into our, to our boot, camp, boot camps. And of course, these days they are all online. So uh, we, um, we, we're, we're servicing a, a large number of, of people every month uh, and getting them uh, trained across all the technologies and capabilities underpin um, our development product. Um, and we, we've been very systematic around how we've worked internally with the teams and understanding the requirements. Uh, and standard, the standardizing in this way is a real, uh, as I mentioned, is a real productivity benefit. Um, it means that uh, we're focusing on velocity of software development. Uh, and if you're familiar with some of the um, the quotes around Spotify, uh, velocity, if you focus on velocity, then um, quality fast is a fast follower. So that's one of the things that's all been back of our mind as soon as we, as, as we have been doing this. Uh, and um, the, uh, the, the heavy lifting should be done as part of this platform so that development teams just, just don't have to think about it. Um, the, the journey, the journey is an important one to go through, though, I feel. So uh, if I think back to um, last year, uh, so 2018, NAB had about 30-odd um, applications in, um, in AWS. Uh, today, um, I think we are, uh, we, we, we are um, 800 plus. And we had a, um, a market commitment to, to get to 35% of our applications being in the cloud by end of this, the end of this financial year. So um, we, we, um, we're always learning. We're always applying that learning and innovation back into uh, the work that we do with, with, with the teams and ensuring that, um, especially in, in, in this approach, that uh, if we can apply a platform approach that's, that enables um, you know, the 70, 75 service teams in our organization, then that, that drives huge benefits and efficiency. Um, and I just wanted to finish up that, that, uh, that definitely the, a key enabler here is being the you know, underpinning approach of using um, the HashiCorp tools to support us uh, we use Terraform and, and Vault, as, as I've already mentioned, but uh, you know we we supply a golden image tool set, Amy tool set for our customers to use uh, internally. We we use Packer. Um, we use a lot of these tools day in day out, um, and they streamline um, the work that we have to do and make it repeatable and and efficient. Uh, and and I think as Dave mentioned before, the, these 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 tools are likely used across your organization as well. And um, it's quite important that you understand and, and make them make them a standard um, so that teams can, can swarm around them and innovate across the top of them. Um, it's a very, probably a very short perspective on, on NAB. Um, I just want to say thanks very much for uh, inviting me on. And uh, um, uh, thank you. And I'll hand back to to uh, to Ilch. Thank you very much. Thanks for that presentation, Andrew. It's great to hear how NAB has come a long way in their cloud adoption journey. Um, now, look, I'm just going to look around to see if we have any questions in the chat. There, there is a few. Um, if if there are any others, please um, type them by the chat, and and I I'll read them out uh, to the group. Uh, there's one here um, that I'm just going to try and paraphrase it because uh, basically uh, it's to Andrew. Uh, it's really interested to understand the development and promotion of Sentinel policy um, with the developers being able to leverage, uh, and this, I'm not sure what this means, open source TFE development. I'm going to 
guess that it's a question around how you're finding uh, Sentinel uh, being. Yep. Uh, yep. So uh, um, I, probably, as I mentioned, we uh, with TFE we we have a we do have a central team that manages TFE. Um, the security team are actively uh, work as as part of that group, uh, and they work work with the team to set Sentinel policy, and Sentinel policy is set at that that top level. Um, so it means that. Uh, if we have um, anything in the CICD pipeline in the infrastructure deployment that is uh, um, is not approved or, or is blocked in that policy, then they could, this, the, 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 the apply simply or the plan will fail um, when it's run. So uh, really, it's just a, just a way of blocking um, blocking anything that's non-compliant from being deployed into to production. So a simple example is we, everything everything has to be a, deployed into the Australian region of AWS, for example. Fantastic. Um, I'm just having a bit of a technical difficulties here with... Um, there's, a, there's another one, I think, which says, given NAB have said they are cloud first, what cultural changes needed to happen to facilitate that? Given existing relationships with vendors, partners, CXO level executives, board of directors, et cetera. Um, look, I think it was, it was something that was relatively straightforward for us. We had, um, we had worked with a, with a partner, obviously, and we were heavily, heavily outsourced for a long time. Um, and we, th and that worked for us, you know, that worked for us at times, there's specific business pressures and, and um, approaches that, that meant that that made sense. Um, now the, the organization embraced it from top down, so from CEO down, and I think that's what we needed to, um, to happen. So I think there had been a, a bottom up sort of approach to cloud for a long time in, in the organization, but CEO level support and support all the way through the organization has definitely made it possible uh, and um, has helped to change the culture. But it, it's all of the, it's, it's the whole ecosystem of, of elements together that make it true. So the, the train retraining your staff, the bringing in, you know, bringing in people to support them. Uh, we have a heavy, heavy focus on insourcing roles and, and people into into teams in our organization. So it's all of those things together that has made it possible. And then and then yeah, being very clear with our vendors that we want application deployment to happen in the cloud and how are they going to support that. Oh fantastic. Look I have one one more that was uh DM to me. Um basically if you're an organization that uh you know has using a bit of cloud native infrastructures code um, and then looking at, you know, use a bit of Terraform, there's a few other products and you're about to kick off a, a journey. What, like, what's your advice? I mean, look, I know you've obviously said all the Terraform, it's a bit of a loaded question. Um, where, where would you, where, um, what did you say the problems were and how did you get everyone to, especially your developers in terms of productivity? Um, to get on board with a single language? Um, I think we're lucky at, at the time is that Terraform is such a standard for teams to to work with. It, what, there wasn't really any problem from that perspective. Uh, we, we, we started working with more than one provider. I think there was, there was quite a lot of CloudFormation um, focused people but once we started working with more than one provider, Terraform just made sense for us. Um, I don't think there's, I don't, I'm not really actually aware of any kind of particular pushback in moving to, to using it. So it's, it's, it's so heavily used across the industry now that, that it was pretty straightforward for us. Yeah, and look, probably a follow-up onto that. You know, you talked about Sentinels and the standards. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. what we find is engineers don't necessarily like them. How, how does NAB navigate that? Uh, we, so me and me and a, a couple other people from the team spent, have spent uh, a significant amount of time with teams across our organization, just meeting with them, talking to them, 
um, understanding where potential problems or issues are and, and just really work, working it through with them. There's no, there's no silver bullet to, 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 to doing that, but understanding how um, this model could work for them and understanding how it worked it, it work with them in terms of their regular role in their day job, but it really helped um, make them understand this was an enabler for them and not something that was a replacement for something they, you know, their role. Because, because what a lot of teams are finding is they're actually starting to, to, to have difficulty scaling themselves. So, actually, really needed something like this to help them scale further and further in terms of their software development. So, um, you know, most most of the, the in interactions and, and conversations have been positive and. Uh, um, it's it's not been too hard to to roll out. I mean, the, the, it, it's definitely been an interesting journey, though. So, um, but as I said, it's it's worth it's it's one worth traveling, especially in an organization this size and scale of that. Yeah. Oh, thanks for that. Look, we're almost out of time. I'm going to fit one more question in. Uh, basically, can you provide an outline as to the size of the team that's managing TFE at the moment for the bank? Um, it's relatively small, to to be honest. Uh, if, we, if you think about the tools, uh, so two pizza team size, uh, no bigger. Um, if you think about it in those the, the, kind of those uh, scales. All right. Well, thank you, Luke. Well, folks. Uh, that brings us to the end of our session today. Uh, we hope you found it useful. As I mentioned earlier, this session was recorded and we'll send you all an email soon with, with a link to the recording. Uh, if you like what you heard today and want to learn more uh, about HashiCorp solutions, uh, I encourage you to check out the Learn pages uh, and uh, on our website, uh, which you can find at learn.hashicorp.com. Thanks again uh, for us. Uh, for joining us today and thank you to our presenters Dave McJanet, Michael Wood and of course Andrew Brighton from NAB. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day and bye for now.